regenerating the thymus. Yes. All right. Welcome to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank it's, you, uh, it's, uh, it's exciting to be here. Thank you. So at Intervene Immune, we deal with human beings most of the time. We do trials today and we work on treatments for tomorrow. You can see some of the digs that we have, uh, some of our local capabilities, lab space and uh, exercise testing capacity. So our mission basically is to deal with what kills us as we get older. And we think that you can trace a lot of what happens to us in aging to what happens to us when we go through puberty. So what you see up in the top uh, left panel is the fact that your thymus uh, deteriorates rapidly after you go through puberty. And that cyan curve is the functional part of the thymus that remains. You can see by the age of 30 or to 40, you have almost no functional mass left in your thymus. This leads ultimately to a collapse of the uh, repertoire of your immune system. You lose about 98% of your ability to recognize foreign antigens between the ages of 60 and 80, which is the same age at which most of us begin to die. And this has been linked down to um, a direct linkage between mortality risk and immune incompetence as shown in the uh, lower uh, left panel, uh, showing about an 80% risk of death within two years from the discovery of poor immune system function. Now, the, imp the importance of this uh, whole thing was uh, underscored recently by a paper that uh, came out in the New England uh, Journal of Medicine last uh, August. And what it shows is that despite this very small amount of uh, active functional mass that you still have left, if you remove it with a thymectomy, then within five years, your risk of being dead from any cause increases by 2.9 fold, and your risk of dying of cancer uh, increases by twofold. So you need every little bit of that thymic mass that you can get, and if we can do anything to increase that by even a little bit, then we're doing uh, people a favor. I compiled some statistics from the uh, Center for Disease Control, and you can see from the, from the curve that um, the risk of death from immune-related causes, including infectious diseases and cancer, skyrockets as we get older. And probably for people over the age of 50, uh, probably half of us or more die of these consequences of immune system failure. And we're also inspired by one other little thing, which is if you give thymus transplants to old animals, it restores other aspects of aging that have deteriorated uh, with time, and it also extends lifespan. So we think that we're on the right track here. And so we've begun doing these clinical trials. Uh, and as the chairman mentioned, I think you're probably aware of many of them. Um, so we, uh, we uh, use uh, a very practical approach to regenerating the thymus. We use a, um, a combination of three known agents that we can repurpose for this, uh, for this uh, project uh, in order to ensure uh, quick uh, regulatory approval by the FDA and other bodies, and to make sure that we're dealing with agents that are safe. Uh, we use growth hormone to regrow the thymus and metformin and DHEA to counteract the diabetogenic side effects of growth hormone. Um, uh, the good thing about this is that uh, all three of these individual agents have their own anti-aging benefits, so this may account for some of the successes that we have seen. And as uh, you just heard, we published our first trial in 2019, and uh, those are the um, uh, participants in that trial. So some of the results, just to summarize in one slide, um, we saw uh, MRI-based evidence of thymus regeneration. As you can see, the photographic uh, evidence on the top left, and then underneath that, the quantitative details. In the upper right, you see recovery of production of naive T cells. These are newly minted T cells, both the CD4 and CD8 variety, as well as the decline in certain senescent CD8 cell populations, which actually prevent you from rejecting cancer as you get older. So all of that was good and in line with what we were hoping to see, but we also saw this interesting effect of reversing epigenetic markers of aging. So in the lower middle panel there, you see an average of four different uh, aging um, Let's see if this works, yes. You see, uh, that's an average of four different uh, uh, aging uh, clocks based on epigenetic markers. Um, 
And that's an independent clock based on the plasma pheno ages, plasma markers. And they both show aging reversing down to about uh, uh, two and a half years or so, uh, at least based on, on those particular uh, uh, metrics. Uh, there has been some question as to whether the aging reversal trends that we're looking at are intrinsic or extrinsic. Are they just reflecting changes in immune cell populations, or are they deeper than that? So we actually ran these tests on uh, the original TRIM study population and showed that both extrinsic aging, which is the immune cell population part, and intrinsic aging, which is something deeper and more widespread, they both reverse. So we think it's both. So what we're going to be talking about mostly today is where we're going uh, from here and, and what we've just accomplished with this new trial called the TRIM-XA trial. So the X in the TRIM-X series uh, of trials uh, refers to the extension of the original TRIM trial. So this will be our, our first attempt to replicate and uh, extend uh, the original study by adding more volunteers. So we have 26 people instead of nine. We have six women in this trial, uh, and uh, we had uh, treatment and growth hormone controls. In other words, people who were taking no treatment at all, or people who were taking just the metformin and the DHEA without the growth hormone. We enrolled people of greater ages who are also a bit sicker, and we included more metrics of functional recoveries, not just numbers uh, in a spreadsheet. So this study is actually now completed except for the analytical phase and we will present the data that we can right now, but we're still getting more uh, uh, results out of this trial. So just to briefly compare the study populations, um, the older population was on average about 67. Uh, the original trial population was about 59, uh, but the epigenetic ages were maybe a lot closer than that, at least based on the plasma pheno age clock. Uh, uh, the difference was almost non-existent between the new groups and the old groups, which means that biologically compared to chronologically, the new treatment groups were much younger than the original one. Some complications. Uh, when we did TRIM, nobody had ever heard of COVID-19. Uh, when we did uh, TRIM-XA, everybody had to be vaccinated for COVID-19. Whether this had any effects on our results, we don't know at this point. We still have to parse that. Um, a few people actually got COVID-19 during the course of the TRIM-XA study. Uh, we're going to have to look back and parse that as well. But as far as side effects are concerned, they were very similar between the two populations. So just to jump into the epigenetic aging results, uh, we were able to reproduce the reversal of epigenetic aging using our treatment. Uh, what you see on the left are four panels showing uh, the four original epigenetic aging clocks that we measured, uh, and they're all going backwards, as we hoped they would. And then two clocks that we did not measure originally, the skin and blood age clock and the fit age clock, all also going back. So it's, it's encouraging to us that we're actually able to re, uh, reproduce these uh, aging reversal effects or apparent aging reversal effects. Now, to underscore that, there was a paper that came out uh, in PNAS last year showing uh, a correlation between younger pheno age, younger grim age, and younger dunnett and pace age, and uh, better outcomes for people two and four years down, downstream. And we heard a little bit earlier today about the importance of being able to predict what's going to happen to you in the future based on what you can measure now. These clocks, at least, seem to be able to do that. And as you see highlighted in green on the left, we have many, many different flavors of these same clocks uh, that we evaluated in TRIM-XA, all, all going backwards. So that's very encouraging. Specifically, if these clocks say that you're younger, then you're going to have fewer functional limitations and a, a, a lower four-year mortality rate. So we think that's very encouraging. I just want to make another more general point about um, uh, how to interpret these aging clocks. Um, there's the first element of it, which is how far back does the clock go, and that's important. There's another element as well, which is how long can you maintain the effect. And these uh, are two examples that we were able to do uh, to obtain as a result of doing the uh, TRIM-XA study uh, that, that give us some insight into this. So in the upper panel, 
the gentleman um, who started off with the red dot, uh, he, he had an epigenet, a, a plasma pheno age of about six, uh, 57. After the trial uh, that he went into, uh, he got down to about 47. So this is the effect of the trim trial. And then later on, he re-entered uh, our, our trial series with the trim XA trial and went down even more. So the horizontal line connects his previous plasma pheno age with his outcome after the second trial. And what you see is that at the end of the second trial, he was 3.1 years younger based on this measure than he had been when he started the trial in the beginning, but that was 6.3 years earlier or so. So he went back about uh, 10 years uh, on average just based on uh, uh, being able to repeat the trial twice. And his brother didn't have very much luck in reversing plasma pheno age, but we were able to maintain it. And so uh, 7.8 years after the trial started, in his case, he had the same plasma pheno age. So these are important advantages as well. So I'll just say that um, so far we haven't seen uh, similar uh, changes in our controls. Uh, and as I said, we have many controls in progress, but uh, these are just two that we had completed in TREMXA. This happens to be Steve Horvath on the left and his brother Marcus in the middle. And neither one of them showed uh, aging reversal based on this plasma pheno age clock, whereas I went back uh, statistically significantly uh, about four, four years after a year. So uh, uh, we think that the full treatment is better than uh, DHE or metformin by itself. Now there's, there's something else interesting that we've come upon recently that I wanted to share with you. And that is the question is how, how much farther can we go with this? Uh, on the left is the data I just showed you for myself in the uh, TRIM-XA trial going back about four years and a year. In the middle is a very new study that we've just done, and Bobby did it on himself too, and it worked for him too. This shows what happened to me on uh, taking a novel therapeutic agent orally, not by injection. And in this case, I went back in the same metric by six years in about 90 days. So that's kind of interesting for us, and the question then is can we combine these two modalities? So after that middle panel study was done, uh, 50 days later, I went uh, and, and started treatment again with the trim trial uh, medications. And after a week, my uh, plasma pheno age was about the same. A week later, it was down by two years by combining the plasma pheno, uh, by combining the trim treatment with this novel agent. So uh, totally anecdotal right now, and uh, I, I can't say anything about the validity in the future, but it, it provides some hint of that we may be able to do better than we've done so far. Now getting to the immunological and inflammatory uh, results of the trim XA trial, uh, you can see uh, that the men went back uh, uh, to a lower CRP, uh, with high statistical significance after 12 months. The women couldn't get there statistically, but they obviously got there biologically. We were only able to evaluate four out of the six, so we didn't quite hit the statistics. You'll also note that the lady started off with a uh, CRP of 0.8, which is very close to zero anyway. Um, and overall, as you can see from the inset, uh, most people reduced their CRP by 50% or so within the first 30 days of treatment and kept it there for the rest of the year. So despite all of the noise and the data, we were able to draw a regression line through that with a statistically significant result. Now getting to the immune cells, um, total lymphocytes uh, increased uh, with, uh, with our treatment and percentage lymphocytes, which is important for the plasma pheno age, which is this Morgan Levine clock, uh, that I've been referring to, uh, that also went up, but we didn't see the same thing happen in our controls. Uh, we saw an increase in recent thymic emigrants as well, a highly statistically significant, and we had uh, an increase in the uh, expected uh, output of naive CD4 and CD8 T cells as well, based on these epigenetic aging clocks. The actual direct measurements are still in progress. We also saw some interesting new things in the trial that we hadn't seen before. Um, specifically impressive are these effects on improved uh, um, exercise tolerance and, and strength. And the first panel uh, 
here is uh, an indication that leg strength improved quite a bit without exercise, and they just got stronger. Nobody was really expecting this, but we had to make a measurement at baseline, and then a year later, and they were much stronger. Um, this is one of two measures that we did with that, of that. We got the same results. In the next panel is VO2 max. Uh, that's going up with high statistical significance. Uh, the net effect of this is a predicted uh, reduction in mortality rate of about 15% or so, if I recall the number correctly. Um, we also had an improvement in lactate threshold, which is related to your ability to keep on exercising under stressful conditions. And we also saw something that's very practical. So uh, one, one thing that governs whether people are institutionalized or not is whether they can get up off the toilet. And uh, you can simulate that kind of thing by making them sit and stand as many times as they can from a stool in 30 seconds. And we saw a major improvement in that as well. Uh, and we also um, uh, saw an improvement in lung capacity measured by those who entered the trial with uh, carbon dioxide levels that were higher than, than normal, that also recovered uh, nicely. So you can see from the people around the margins of this uh, slide that uh, the, the, the volunteers are pretty happy with all of these uh, changes, including, I will say, um, our um, track star, 81-year-old track star guy winning all these medals after going on our treatment. So he was happy. All right, we also saw improvements in uh, resting pulse and in diastolic blood pressure. Uh, we saw improvements in total fat, a 14% decrease in uh, uh, body uh, fat percentage, uh, reduction in visceral adipose tissue, uh, and uh, a gain in lean body mass of 1.3 kilograms, and many people reported weight loss. So where we're going next is uh, we want to develop this novel biological agent, and we also want to make our own growth hormone. Uh, what you can see um, in this panel is our bioreactor. We have two of them. That's the small one. Uh, we think that the economics of being able to make our own growth hormone will be very attractive. We've also acquired new laboratory space so that we can pursue a variety of other projects uh, in drug discovery. So we do have a drug dis development pipeline uh, ahead of us. Uh, in addition to doing uh, clinical trials, which pretty much could be made to break even so that we can conserve our resources to do uh, these additional pipeline projects, uh, we have uh, a number of things that we're, we're looking at, in, including uh, uh, supplements for uh, somatotropin, uh, somatotropin itself, and uh, uh, novel drug, uh, uh, targets that we can derive from uh, our unique database of epigenetic data. Um, we're also going to have uh, spin-offs into the areas of re-engineering the immune system based on uh, uh, the fact that you, if you can regrow the thymus, then you can re-engineer it to avoid transplant rejection and autoimmune disorders, and we're hoping to do our first experiments on that next year. Uh, I won't say much more on this right now, but um, we do have about five pathways that we would like to carry forward, uh, each uh, to be funded by about a $10 million level. Uh, so we are a growing uh, group of uh, people. We're very fortunate to have good collaborators, including Steve Horvath and Dr. Shreyas Vasanawala at uh, Stanford University, Dr. Uh, Joe Sherger, who's our uh, study physician, and Paul Hynek, who's our uh, CFO. Uh, we are in contact with other individuals who we hope to form strategic alliances with uh, uh, either later this year or early next year. So in conclusion, uh, the company has uh, uh, therapies available right now that uh, seem to be able to reverse markers of aging in people. Uh, the, the therapy has real life benefits that can be obtained right now. Uh, and according to the correlations that I mentioned to you, they may actually be shown eventually to reduce age-related morbidity and mortality. Uh, and we have uh, demonstrated demand for our services. People are paying to uh, enroll themselves in our trials. Uh, and we have pathways to organic growth through the development of the BioBetter uh, formulation of growth hormone and other uh, agents, and we're developing new alliances. So feel free to contact us after this uh, for uh, business or scientific uh, purposes, and 
Uh, I'll just leave you with this thought. This is our 81-year-old track star guy uh, underscoring the fact that our mission is to uh, improve human longevity and health and achieve extraordinary results. Uh, so thanks for your attention.